the king of my heart be the mountain where i run the fountain i drink from oh he is my soul let the king of my heart be the shadow where i hide the ransom for my life oh he is my soul you are good you're good oh you are good let's just start our morning simply declaring you are good you're good oh you are good you're good oh let the king of my heart the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my soul. Let the king of my be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, sing that again. Let the king, let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my soul let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my soul cause you are good you're good to 
that God is here this morning, that he's in us, he's around us, and that he wants to speak something specifically to us, move in our lives, transform us, show us who he is. So I just want to open up to that this morning, create a little room, a little space. We would just say, God, would you move in power? Would you breathe afresh on us this morning? God, we're open, we're available to what you're doing. It's the posture of our hearts. The one who made the blind to see is moving here in front of me, moving here in front of me. The one who made the deaf to hear is silencing my every fear, silencing my every fear. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. Let's just sing that real simple. I believe in you. I believe in you, you're the God of miracles, yes you are. It's reaching out to make me whole, reaching out to make me whole. The one who put death in its place, his life is flowing through my veins. His life is flowing through my veins. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God. God of miracles 
the God who was and is to come, the power of the risen world, the God who brings the dead to life, you're the God of I can't control. I want more of you. Let's sing now. I want more. Set a fire. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more. We cry out for more. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. More and more of you. Let's sing this next part real simple. There's no place. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. But here in your love, here in your love, there's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. But here in your love, here in your love. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more. One more time, let's sing. Set a fire. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you. That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you, God yeah. 
we're going to spend the next few minutes calling on the Lord, not only to meet us here, but to breathe over this place. And what does it look like when he's not only here, but he's also working with us, partnering with us in what we're asking him to do, in the miracles that we're asking him to do, in the places of our hearts where we feel disappointment, regret, and fear, all those places. What happens when Jesus comes in and we ask him to meet us here and we ask him to to breathe on these dry bones, to bring these bones back to life, to resurrect the things that he wants to resurrect and then to let go of the things that he wants us to let go. What does that look like? So in the next few minutes, we're gonna sing a little bit about that. And first part is to ask him to come and breathe over this place. So we're just gonna lift up this simple, simple line. Breathe the breath of God now. Breathe the breath of God. Breathe the breath of God now. Breathe. Breathe the breath of God now. Breathe the breath of God. Breathe the breath of God now. Breathe. Let's lift it up. Breathe. Breath of God now, breathe a breath of God, breathe the breath of God now, breathe. We're calling on you, breathe the breath of God now, breathe the breath of God, breathe the breath of God now, breathe. Sing it again, sing it again, breathe the breath of God. business as usual. We want to just go through the motions, but Lord, we want you to breathe fresh life, fresh fire into our hearts, into our lives. We want to make room for that this morning. Holy Spirit, we invite you, not just another service, not just another gathering, but God, a time and a place to meet with the living God this morning. So Holy Spirit, come and have your way. Would you open our eyes to the ways that you're moving, things that you're speaking into, leading us into. We make ourselves available to everything that you have this morning. We pray in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Y'all can be seated. you to say hi to each other and ask each other this quick question. When is the last time you had a dream in your sleep? That question was given to me. <laughs> so ask each other that.
All right. Y'all can start t heading to your seats. Nate was trying to exercise y'all this morning. Sorry about that. Um, well, like I said, welcome to Church of the City. We're really happy to have you here. I would like to invite the worship hosts up to receive the offering. And as they're coming up, I just wanted to um, kind of reflect on the past couple of weeks, the church has been fasting together, and we've been learning more about the names of God. I don't know if you guys have been listening to the podcast or the devotionals that are on the app, but um, we're learning about the names of God, like Redeemer, Emmanuel, Good Father. But we've also been learning about the names that he affectionately calls us, like son, daughter, co-heir. And as co-heirs to the kingdom of God, God's inviting us into what he's doing. He wants us to participate and one of the most tangible ways that we can do that is by giving. So let me pray over our offering before the worship hosts receive that. God, thank you um, that you know our name. Thank you for the ways that you affectionately call us to participate in what you're doing, Lord. So we pray that you will bless this offering in this time and use our gifts um, and do with them what you can only do, Lord. In your name, amen. All right, so while the worship hosts are receiving the offering, we have a lot going on in the church right now. And so if you guys could get out your app or the website and follow along with these announcements, that might be helpful because there are lots of RSVPs um, and signups that you can um, participate in. So first of all, stakeholders. Stakeholders is what we call membership here at Church of the City. And anyone who's interested in exploring that, if you've been thinking about uh, potentially joining, this is a great way uh, to get involved. So stakeholders classes where you can meet other people, you can hear the story of the church, which we're actually kind of talking about um, right now in our, our series. And then you can also kind of dive into the mission, the values, the vision, and the beliefs of the church. So our next stakeholders class is next Sunday, January 20th from 1 to 5. It'll be in this building downstairs. So you can sign up by going to the website or the app. Um, find Sylvan Park on the app and then just click stakeholders. Space is limited for this one, so make sure you sign up beforehand. We've also got groups here, and groups are a great way to get connected beyond just the Sunday morning experience. And so, first of all, we've got missional communities, and missional communities are really fun. Woo, yeah. Um, we meet in homes, we study the Bible, we share meals together, we serve the city together. They're really, really special and um, just a chance to dive deeper here. So to sign up for those, you can email Rachel at churchofthecity.com, and she will get you all plugged in there. We've also this season got integration groups, and this is a new thing for us that Jake has really spearheaded. And these are designed for personal development and spiritual growth. So this is even a step beyond missional communities and kind of looking inward at yourself um, we have limited space in these as well, and tomorrow is the last day for you to sign up. So you've got till Monday evening to apply, and for these, you can go to www.churchofthecity.com slash discipleship app. And lastly, we've got B, which is our women's workshop spearheaded by a bunch of incredible women in this room in order to grow uh, the community here. And we've got our next one on Saturday, January 26th. So again, sign up on the app or go to the website. We provide food, um, little snacks and stuff, so we want to know if you are coming. And then lastly, we've got Financial Peace University here. We're excited to be offering this at a discounted rate of $50 a person. And this is a class that will help you master budgeting, um, paying off debt, building wealth, and giving generously. And this will be a really um, great time to learn about that. So that group will get started February 2nd, and it will go for nine weeks. There's a cap for that group as well. So sign up on the app or the website. Um, we want to know if you're coming. All right. 
end of announcements. Um, I hope you guys are able to participate in some of those things because um, we've got we've worked really hard on them, and um, I'm excited to see what God does through those. But last week we started a new series called Fame and Deeds, and I'm going to read the passage that Jake's going to be teaching from today. So will you please stand in honor of the reading of the word? This is from Ezekiel 37, 1 through 3. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Jordan. Well, good morning, my beloved. Uh, 21 days of prayer and fasting. Sounds great on paper, but when you're actually doing it, um, it can be difficult. It's challenging. So for those who have elected to take part in that, here we are at day 13. Um, if I see those of you participating blankly staring out the window today, I'll know you're either hallucinating or you're having some kind of supernatural vision, and both are okay. Uh, I want, want you to know that. For me, the toughest days, like, I know them. Day two, day eight, day ten. The hardest. I don't know why. Those days stand out in particular, too. I had a massive headache that was debilitating. Ten, I was so hungry that, like, the dinosaur-shaped chicken nuggets... I was preparing for my children, uh, looked delicious, and, uh, and, then, and then the same for day 10. So um, <clears throat> if you're in the middle of that, keep going. I was at a gathering in Phoenix early last week, and it was just a gathering of some of um, the leading disciple-making minds in America, and somehow I stumbled into that and just got to be a fly on the wall and listen to these guys just uh, talk as they tried to fan into flame these disciple first churches nationally and, and call churches back to that as their priority, like their number one priority. And one of the things that stood out to me from that meeting is that disciple first churches, churches who care about disciple making above all else, um, all of them care deeply about prayer and fasting as a, as a cultural dynamic. It's like these churches do this not just kind of as a, a cool thing or a project or like it's like it's built into the DNA of the place. If we don't pray and fast, we will not see the healing and the transformation and the clarity of life, purpose, and calling um, unleashed in our congregation like we would otherwise. And so they, they're just dedicated to it. So I couldn't be more excited um, that we are a church who's building prayer and fasting into the DNA of our church, that um, many of you are doing that now, and thank you. Uh, keep being faithful um, to that. Let's keep going, and uh, let's ask God to move powerfully in our lives, and if you are just hearing about this for the first time, or you've kind of been on the fence on it, you want to jump in, it's not too late, uh, go ahead and jump in. You can do that by texting COTC21 days to the number 555-888, COTC21 days um, to 555-888. What that's going to do is every morning you'll get texted the guided prayer. So it's, uh, it's kind of a reading if you want to do that, but um, the coolest thing is Anthony Skinner has put out like this 10-minute guided prayer podcast. So you literally just pop in your deal and, and driving to work or taking a walk around your neighborhood or sitting in a chair in your living room. You just listen to this and just follow it. Just do what he says. And um, I want to pay Anthony Skinner to come into my bedroom every morning and just speak over me. Because his baritone voice is a gift from God. It's amazing. So um, do yourself a favor and just text for that. Just so you can hear him read over you in the morning. It's, it's fantastic and, and you'll um, get that. But let's keep surrendering to the Spirit of God and seek what he has for our city. Okay. We're continuing our series called Fame and Deeds um, this morning. Uh, it's an important series. This is right at the heart of what we declare the mission of our church to be. Which um, if you haven't heard the mission of our church... The mission of our church is to see the fame and deeds of God renewed in our day from the uh, Old Testament uh, prophet Habakkuk's prayer. And um, you can actually go back and listen to the message that was on that verse, Habakkuk 3.2, last week, if you were so inclined. But this week, we are looking, as you might have guessed at this point, uh, at Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, have you ever um, woken up from a dream 
that you didn't want to wake up from. It's just like you want to, like, it's, you're coming into consciousness and this amazing dream you're having is like slipping through your fingers. Maybe you're on a beach somewhere and you're about to wake up to the reality of your life, you know, and you're just like, no, 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 just like, and you, you actually try to go back to sleep so that you can continue it. That's rarely happened to me, but when I, when I do, it's, it's wonderful and terrible all at the same time. Or, on the other side, have you ever um, woken up from a dream and you felt deep relief that it was just a dream? <laughs> like something tragic, some crisis, something happened to someone you love, um, you know, uh, some chaos uh, was kind of playing itself out in your subconscious state. And when you woke up, it's just like, oh my goodness, thank you, God, that that was just a dream. So we've got good dreams, we've got bad dreams, and then there are dreams that aren't good or bad, they're just weird. Um, I remember six years ago, uh, I remember because it's like right when we were moving here to plant Church of the City, and I, I hardly ever dream, but I had this dream, so I was like paying particular attention, like, God, do you want to speak to me through my dreams? It's like, I had this dream. And in this dream, I crawl up into the attic of my house. It's not really my house, but it's, I, in, my, in the dream, I know it's my house. And I crawl up into this attic, and there's bats everywhere, like a plethora of bats, all different sizes. There's like huge six-foot-tall bats, and there's small bats, and they're everywhere, but I'm not scared. I'm just like, like my whole thinking on it is like, all right, bats. And that's it. Like, you know, there's bats in the attic, and I wake up, and I, that's a weird dream. It's just a weird dream. So I'm Googling the next day about bats in dreams, and what does that mean? The first thing that comes up, by the way, is uh, Nashville bat removal. So way to go, Google AdWords. You're doing your job well. Nice. And then there's stuff about how big bats represent unfaced problems in your life. And then there's another thing about how if you have a, a, a lot of these bats just kind of hanging out in your house, it means something negative is going to happen to someone that you love. And I'm like going, everyone I know in my life is in big trouble because the attic was filled with these bats, you know. And then I keep reading and others speculate that bats represent your unrealized potential to achieve great things. And I just shut the laptop and I'm like, we're going with that one untapped potential in the attic of my life. That's what we're going with. Now, I don't know what that dream meant, but sometimes dreams are just weird. Now, a few minutes ago, Jordan read the first couple of verses from Ezekiel chapter 37. And let's be honest, it's a little weird. You got this guy that's kind of swept off to this death valley, this valley of dead bones. And uh, if you've read this story, like he's going to prophesy to them, whatever that means. And then they're going to rattle, and like skeletons are going to come to life, this army of skeletons, but then like flesh is going to form, he's going to breathe light, they're going to come back to life. And it just, it's one of those Bible moments where you're just going, come on, is this thing for real? Like, you know, can we really count on this thing? Is this just this odd supernatural occurrence? So we're going to be digging into this a little bit today. First, a little background. This guy named Ezekiel um, lived and wrote about this dream or this vision that he had a little more than 2,500 years ago, so about 500 years before Jesus is born, uh, Ezekiel lived, and he's writing about this. And we know it's a vision, and not kind of like this literal historic reality, because he starts off with the phrase in verse 1, the hand of the Lord was on me. Now this is an odd little phrase that means prophetic ecstasy and inspiration. So we're talking about something that um, not literally happened here. It's something that's more like a dream or more like a vision that Ezekiel had when he was caught up praying and spending time in a deep, connected experience with God. So maybe he's meditating on a mountaintop or um, he's, just, he's lost in prayer and it's in this moment of kind of seeking God that he has this vision. And I just want to take a quick exit ramp in this talk, and I want to say this to you. These types of experiences, like these deep, spiritual, weird, lofty, supernatural, connective, visionary experiences, prophetic visions that prophets like Isaiah in the Bible have, 
uh, for example, and like Ezekiel describes here, they are not limited to certain spiritual superstars in the spiritual life. It's not that only certain kinds of kind of really specially called out anointed people have these kinds of experiences and these kinds of visions. The hand of the Lord being on you and bringing you out is something that's there for you if you want it. You have to go after it. You have to take hold of the promises of God and trust that he wants to speak to you in many ways and shapes and forms. You have to really seek God in prayer for it, but you're not going to be left out with this type of thing if you seek it. Because I believe prayerful vision is one of the ways God has spoken to us throughout history. Now, maybe you've never considered that, but I just want to put it out there because some of you, I believe, uh, God could give amazing visions for our city, for this church, for your family, for your calling. If you're just willing to not kind of take yourself out of the game and put yourself on the spiritual bench and just say, I'll just wait for other people to have that weird stuff happen to them. That's probably really not something that I'm into or I'm wired for that's ever going to happen to me. I'm telling you, it's there for you. So uh, go after it if that intrigues you even a little bit. Say, God, I want you to give me vision. God, I want you to give me dreams. God, I'm going to seek you in prayer to know your heart. I want you to show me what's in my heart. Show me what you have. Go after that. Okay. So Ezekiel is caught up in this vision. And in the vision, the Holy Spirit, uh, the Bible says, takes him to a place that's described as a valley of death. Uh, we know it's a valley of death because it's filled with what appears to be thousands of human ancient bones. And there are two characteristics to describe the bones. Characteristic number one is they're numerous. So there's lots and lots and lots of these. And characteristic number two is they're very dry, uh, which means they've been there for a very long time. Now, I wanted to add that there is actually a third characteristic of these bones that's not literally written here in black and white, but with a little bit of historical digging you'll find that the third characteristic of these bones is this. They are disgraced. There's lots of them, or arbitrary. What's happening here, we find out later in the passage, is that God is actually giving Ezekiel a powerful picture of what's happening in his own heart, which is so often how God uses dreams. We're so good at repression and avoidance and numbing ourselves to things Dreams can be the only time that God has our full attention, and he brings to the surface what's bubbling underneath. He shows us what's actually happening in our own heart. So it's important to ask the question in doing this hermeneutical study, what did these bones represent to Ezekiel? What is God showing Ezekiel that's in his own heart? Well, if you remember back to last week, Ezekiel's country, Israel, had been divided, and then a couple hundred years later, with Ezekiel watching, it was crushed by the Babylonians. So remember last week, Habakkuk is praying, God, I've heard of your fame. I stand in all of your deeds. Renew them in our day and our time. Make them known in wrath. Remember mercy. And it's been about a thousand years when Habakkuk prays that prayer since uh, God has kind of done the miraculous, like the unexplained parting seas and causing fortress cities to crumble and fall and all that stuff. So a thousand years. And so back he's saying, I've heard about that stuff. Would you do it again? And how does God answer that prayer? But by wiping out the very city that he's a part of, crushes it through the uh, Babylonian empire. They come in and they wipe out everything. But that catalyzes the miraculous hand of God showing up on earth again. And you've got Daniel uh, and the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the, in the fiery furnace and Queen Esther appearing before the king and uh, helping avoid genocide, and Nehemiah getting letters and going back to rebuild the city, and like all this stuff happens as a result of the prayer. Well, Ezekiel is right in the middle of that uh, as it unfolds. He would have been alive when Habakkuk prayed that prayer, uh, restore your fame and deeds. We want to see your fame and deeds restored again. Now, Ezekiel himself was a priest, but he never officially served in that position because he was still a really young guy when his country was destroyed by the Babylonians. So he probably was a teenager when they came through and wiped out Jerusalem and finished it off. 
Now, the prophet Jeremiah, that's another uh, prophetic book in the Old Testament. You can read through the book of Jeremiah. He was alive at this time also. He would have been a very old man. And he was kind of, when the Babylonians came through and, and destroyed Jerusalem, he was kind of left there, the prophet Jeremiah. He was left in the city of Jerusalem, left for dead, along with several other people. And Daniel and his contemporaries um, were taken from the city. So they, when the, Jerusalem was crushed, they took Daniel and they captured them and they became prisoners of war, and they took them to Babylon. And so you got Jeremiah, who stays in the city. He's kind of prophesying to these uh, left for deads in the city. You've got Daniel and those guys, and they, like, survive lion's dens and fiery furnaces when they refuse to stop praying to the one true God. And so they kind of get this voice, and they're prophesying to the king's court in Babylon. And then right here in the middle, you've got Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is the voice to the refugees. They left the city. There's nothing left for them there. Their home was gone. And they end up living on the banks of the river of Babylon, homeless, wandering, uh, much like the Israelites did. And so here's the situation. Here is Ezekiel. Israel's been wiped from the face of the earth. He had watched it happen as a young man. He leaves the city of Jerusalem. There's nothing left for him there. And there is no doubt that as he walked away from Jerusalem, as it burned behind him, the road he traveled would have been littered on either side with thousands of the slain bodies of the Israelites, dead, unburied, slain for miles. For Ezekiel... Israel is dead, and she would never live again. And this is what the bones in his vision represent. A dead country, a dead culture, and a dead dream that has no hope of ever living again. But God has a question for Ezekiel about the bones. And the question is in verse 3. God's question is, Ezekiel, can these bones live? Now, if another human being had asked him that question, it would have been absurd. I used to live in Las Vegas, and we'd go hiking a lot just outside the city. Um, there are some incredible opportunities uh, to uh, do some outdoors kind of kind of stuff on that desert landscape and through canyons and we used to hike at night a lot we'd have these headlamps and like one of the freakiest but most exciting things ever is you, like you'd be hiking along and then you'd sense a presence and you'd like turn around and your light would catch the eyes of the mountain lion that was like stalking you and you just see his eyes in the dark and it's like that's terrifying and awesome you know but because these things roamed around these canyons Often, when you uh, would be on these hikes, you'd come to a dead corpse. Uh, maybe it's a, a mountain goat or something like that. But um, all that would be left after sitting out in the, the desert sun, after this mountain lion perhaps had killed it, uh, and the scavengers had done their work, would just kind of be uh, this skeleton or this, this carcass. And it, it was very, very cool. But how preposterous would it have been if I'm out hiking and we come along the bones of this, you know, this mountain goat or whatever, and if I looked at my friends at that moment and said, hey guys, can these bones live? Like these bones that have been here for who knows how long and has no, like no organs, like nothing left. It hasn't just been kind of wounded. Like, like can these bones live? That's just ludicrous. Of course, they would say, have you, are you, do you have heat exhaustion? Do you need more water? If you've been out in the sun too long, I mean, it's just a preposterous question. A human being, like, I don't care how smart they are. I don't care how talented they are. I don't care how hard that human being is willing to work. There are just some things in this life, when you've got a valley full of dry, dead, disgraced bones, like, don't even ask the question. The answer is a given. Dry bones don't live again. That's the rules. But here's the thing. It's not a human being that's asking. 
It's the living, limitless God of creation and recreation. It's the God who not only heals sick things, but the God who resurrects dead things. There was a man in the New Testament who said to God in flesh, please heal my son if you can. God in flesh responded in Matthew 9, if you can, everything is possible for one who believes. In John 11, a man named Lazarus has been dead for four days. Significant number because you're not coming back after four. Three, maybe. Four, no way. When Jesus shows up, Lazarus' sister Martha, amazing woman of faith, runs up to him and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus says to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he calls to Lazarus and he brings him back to life. And he does this kind of thing again and again and again. And in Matthew 19, 26, Jesus says, With man this, like this kind of stuff, is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Can these bones live? God asks Ezekiel. The question is less important than who it is that's asking the question. Ezekiel is wise in his response, which is this. Only you know. Only you know. Now, what that means, only you know, is, well, it depends, God. Can these bones live? It depends. What do you want to do with these bones? Because if you want these bones to live, I don't care how hopeless it is. I don't care how long these bones have been laying here lifeless. I don't care how many of them there are. I don't care how disgraced they are. However impossible the proposition, if you want these bones to live, they will live. So what do you want to do? That's what only you know means. That's the correct answer to the question. Look at God's response in verses 4 through 6. God says, can these bones live? Ezekiel says, only you know, which is if you want them to live, uh, they're going to live. What do you want to do? God says, what do I want to do? Here's what I want to do. Verse 4. Prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you. And you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord. Now there's three things we see in God's response to Ezekiel here. Three things. We see God's method. We see God's message. And we see God's motivation. God's method is Ezekiel. God didn't need Ezekiel to bring the bones to life, but he decided, God within himself decided, the bones would only live when Isaiah engaged with them. If the bones are going to live, God's not just going to show up and do it. Ezekiel has to prophesy, which basically just means he's going to have to open his mouth and call the bones into God's plan and purpose. That's what prophesy to them means. I'm going to open my mouth. I'm going to say words out loud, calling the bones into God's plan and purpose. He has to invite the bones to live. So that, that, that's his only role. It's not even that hard. Now I want to say here, I don't understand why God invites us. I don't understand why God includes us in his redemptive process. But he does. One of the things I heard Bill Hull say this week in Phoenix, uh, Bill Hull's 74-year-old brilliant man, discipled by Dallas Willard, he said that Dallas said to him once, if Christians don't believe 
It is their responsibility to make disciples, to, to speak and to call people into God's plan and purpose. We're going to have unredeemed, untransformed, unhealed, consumeristic Christians. You must believe that you have a role, that you have a responsibility to prophesy, to speak words to others, and to call them into God's redemptive plan and purpose. That's all you have to do. That's when God shows up in power, when you take that risk and you step out in faith. There are things in you and there are things in people around you that God wants to bring to life. And you will be his method. The power is going to come from him, but you can make flesh and tendon and put on bones and give it living breath. Only God can do that part. But he will only do it when you've stepped into your part. And sometimes our role is to simply speak. Prophesy to these bones, God says. That's your part of this. Ezekiel is his method. God's message is resurrection. God's message is where there has been death, where there has been disappointment, where there has been disgrace, where there has been despair, I will bring life. Other human beings and other realities in this world declare these bones unworthy of life. But that's not what I think, and guess what? I'm the life giver. That is what I'm about. When Jesus declares the reason for his divine earthly invasion, he says in John 10.10, I have come Why? That they may have life and have it to the full. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for this world. God's message then is the same as his message now. He loves you and he wants to raise you to life. Life is his message. And God's motivation, make no mistake, is his fame and deeds. That's what's driving him. His own fame and deeds. Why is God going to bring these bones to life? Look at the last sentence of verse 6. His motivation is because when I bring these bones to life, when I do this miraculous thing, then you will know that I am the Lord. Jesus says in John 12, 32, And I, when I am lifted up, or some versions say, when I am exalted from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. So just look here in Ezekiel at this amazing redemption cycle. God uses people to bring his message, after which he creates life and receives glory. That draws more people to himself whom he sends with his message. He creates more life and receives more glory, which draws more people until you have this life-giving army of people that embody God's heart and lift him up and draw more and see healing and transformation in life come. That's the cycle. So how does this all turn out in Ezekiel chapter 37? Look at verse 7. Ezekiel says... I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. The bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons of flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. They're basically zombies. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Here's the main idea this morning in this teaching series, Fame and Deeds. God has three wants for your life. He wants to bring you to life. 
He wants to use you to bring others to life. And he wants his own fame and deeds as a life giver to spread throughout the earth. He wants to bring you to life. He wants to use you to bring others to life. And he wants his fame and deeds as a life giver to spread throughout the earth. The question this morning is, will you surrender to what God wants? Worship host, would you please come forward and prepare to receive our offering this morning? When I was a pastor in Las Vegas, you guys can immediately go and um, start to distribute the communion elements. When I was a pastor in Las Vegas, um, I was returning phone calls one day uh, of just someone who had filled out a card in the service, and I had, a, um, I had a card filled out from a woman we'll call Melissa. And um, Melissa had checked a box that she wanted to join a small group at our church. So I just called her up, and I said, uh, hey, Melissa, you know, Jake from the church, just um, wanted to follow up and get you in a small group. And she must have misunderstood me, because I have never been cursed out as aggressively and as insidiously as I was by this woman on the phone that day. I let her finish, and then I cleared my throat. <clears throat> Melissa, sorry, I, I may not have communicated clearly. Jake, pastor from the church. And something clicked for her, and she said, oh, 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 oh. She goes, sorry, pastor. She said, uh, no, I'm, I'm not interested in a, a small group. Actually, that was a mistake. I'm actually not made for church. I don't belong in church. And that made me sit up and pay attention. I mean, she's the one that filled out the card. She had to have been there. I said, Melissa, your story, I'm very curious about it. What's led you to the point of feeling like you, you, know, you can't fit with us, you don't belong with us? Can I please buy you a coffee? I just want to hear the story. She acted a little confused and said, I guess. So we set up this... Um, uh, time and this date, and I, I'm at this coffee shop in uh, Las Vegas. It's a beautiful spring day. I'm sitting outside, kind of panning in the parking lot, uh, wondering who Melissa is and, and when she'll come. And car after car pulls in, and you know, these different ladies pass me, and it's not her, it's not her. Finally, this car pulls in, and this woman emerges, um, platinum blonde hair, like the color of those curtains, and a like a sweatsuit, like terry cloth jumpsuit, head to toe, hot pink, stilettos, hot pink, pulls a poodle out of the car, dyed hot pink, with a rhinestone hot pink leash that wound its way down to this dog. And she literally, no lie, walked in like this, all the way up to the, and I'm thinking, this cannot be Melissa. Walked right up to me. You Pastor Jake, you must be Melissa. Went inside, bought my coffee, bought her her hot pink strawberry frappuccino. Went back outside, sat down, slid across to her and said, all right, tell me your story, you know. And she said, ah, oh, well, where do I begin? I'm a prostitute. And I'm like, <laughs> I need to call an accountability partner and be here right now. <laughs> you know, uh, you know uh, she said, um, my boyfriend's a drug lord. Uh, he's like over the whole like southwestern United States for the particular group he's with. He wants me dead because I know things. And um, I'm like waiting for the red dot to pop up on my chest, you know. And she said, um, you know, I, I uh, have the police watching me pretty closely right now because, um, you know, they, they know who my boyfriend is. They, wanna, they think they can get to him through me, so they're watching me. That's making it hard to work. Prostitution is actually, believe it or not, illegal in Vegas. You've got to go a county over for it to be legal. So they're watching me closely right now, so I've got to be careful with how I work. So I've been meeting my clients in churches. That's why she was there that day. She's trying to blend in, like kind of meeting her guy and like, what do you do in church? I don't know what you do in church. Fill out this card? Sure. Check, I want to be in a small group. Boom, in the offering plate. Bam, I'm blending in. You know, that's it. That's how we've connected. And I said, man, that, that is an amazing story. You know, I found out pretty quickly she hates men. You might imagine why. After years of being abused and objectified by men who were not kind, uh, men who were not good. 
and she's got these long, beautiful fingernails, but they hurt when they poke your chest, I found out. She's poking my chest, and she's saying to me, what makes you so different, Pastor? What makes you so different from these men who come to see me? I'm going, nothing. Nothing. Everything that's in them is in me. I just know Jesus, and he's redeeming me and resurrecting me to life and changing me, and, and he's my only hope, Melissa. And she wanted to go. She got flustered. And I said, that's okay. Can we meet here next week? And she said, okay. So we went our separate ways. She came back the next week, still wearing the same, different outfit, but the same hot pink, massive sunglasses that she'd never taken off. I'd never seen her eyes. And we sat through the whole thing. She said, I told me, you my story. I want you to tell me your story. And I tell her my story, which is really boring compared to hers. Um, grew up moving around a lot. That was hard. You know, it's like, what do you do? And uh, I get to the end and I say, Cousin, why, why don't you come to church with me? She, she just laughed and she said, no, I, I don't belong in church. I, I don't belong in church. And she said, I want to go. And she kind of escaped again. And, but this time I walked to the car with her. She got in her car and she, she laughed. I said, next week. She goes, okay. We circle back to next week. We meet again. And she walks up and I just decided, I just want to tell her about Jesus. Like, Jesus, I, he's, like, he's like no other man that you've ever met. Uh, he is kind. He loves you. He's a healer and a life giver. And um, I'm telling you, if you'd be willing to take the risk and open up your heart to him, um, he, can make, he can make all things new. He can bring dead bones to life. I didn't say that, but you know what I mean in this context. He can bring dead bones to life. And I said, will you please come to church with me this week? She said, no, and she got up to leave again. Like, that's the trigger, you know, and I'm walking to her cars, and I said, I said, try it once. I'll connect you with some great women that are there that are trustworthy. If you don't like it, you never have to come again. For the first time, she took off those big hot pink glasses. She was crying. Tears were running down her face like mascara. She had these beautiful, like, clear crystal blue eyes. She said, uh, she said, I, I don't know what to wear. I said, wear whatever you want. She said, I don't know how to act. I said, you don't have to act anyway. Just sit in the back. You don't have to sing. I don't even care if you listen. Like, just, just come and just sit there. Just sit in the chair. You don't have to act any certain way. And then looking at her stilettos, real soft where I could barely hear it, she said, I'm dirty. I'm a prostitute. I don't belong in church. I said, I'm dirty too. Let's go together. And she showed up that week. And I swear to you, I had no idea that our pastor was preaching on how Jesus was a friend of prostitutes. If we're just willing to prophesy, God can bring dead bones to life. And I watched that woman escape the industry that she was in, get connected up with trustworthy women and men in our church, go on a journey of healing and restoration, get a new job driving a limousine from the Las Vegas airport. If you've ever been, maybe she was your driver one day. I don't know. All I know is there are no dead, dry, disgraced bones anywhere in this life that God can't raise up. I wonder if you take a moment now just to settle in, to become in tune with the Holy Spirit who longs to speak with you. I like to close my eyes, just a way for me to focus and really lock into God. Maybe you want to take a deep breath just as a means of becoming present. Two big breaths.
And now here in this moment, I'd like you to consider this question this morning as you sit here, sitting in this ancient vision. Ask yourself, ask the Holy Spirit, what are the dry bones of your life? Talking about inside of you, your dry bones. What is it that's been disgraced? What's been left for dead with no hope of resurrection in you? I wonder here in this moment if you'd be willing to ask the Holy Spirit to bring those bones to life. God, bring those bones to life. And the second question, I wonder if you'd be willing to ask this morning, what are the hopeless places or the hopeless people around you that God's calling you to bring to life? What are the hopeless places and the hopeless people around you that God's calling you to bring to life. Maybe you want to ask God, God, how are you inviting me to bring dry bones around me to life? How? What are you asking me to do? You don't necessarily need to arrive at an answer to that question right now in this moment, but I wonder if you'd be willing to ask the Holy Spirit to use you to bring those dry bones to life. God, use me. This is not someone else's responsibility. This is my responsibility. You've shown me these dry bones, so I do not pawn it off on some other Christian. Whether you've walked with God for a week or 65 years, Maybe you say to God right now, I will be obedient to your invitation to me. Use me, God, to bring those dry bones to life. Don't raise up somebody else. Raise up me. I will prophesy. Now, the reason we can do this kind of work is because that verse we talked about, where Jesus cares about his fame and deeds, and if I will be raised up, I'll draw all men unto me. You know what he was talking about there? He wasn't talking about a stage. He wasn't talking about his profile or his reputation. Being raised up, being glorified was about the cross. You raised me up on that cross off of this earth. Be forewarned, forces of darkness. You do that to me. And you just watch. You just watch the dry bones I'll bring to life. Starting with my own. Now, if you want to put your faith in that power, show it by taking this bread, his body given for you, to eat. And the cup, his blood poured out for you to drink. And this is an important part of our service, the benediction. Would you stand? And we're going to seal these promises with our united singing. Let's sing these promises into reality together.
We call out to draw bones, come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. About of the ashes, let us see an army rise. Oh, we call out to draw bones, come alive. Let's call in the spirit last time to breathe. Breathe the breath of God now. Breathe the breath of God. Breathe the breath of God now. Breathe. Breathe the breath of God now. Breathe the breath of God. Breathe the breath of God now. Breathe. Sing it again. Breathe. Breath of God now breathe, oh breath of God, breathe, the oh breath of God now breathe, last time breathe, breathe, the oh breath of God now breathe, the oh breath of God, breathe, the oh breath of God now breathe. We call. after this 21 days of prayer and fasting thing like where do we go from there was that just kind of a thing and we're done and um, I propose we keep riding the tidal wave of that um, we're going to break our fast on day 21 uh, however the prayer will continue and we can even I'd love an insurgence of new uh, prayers to join those of us who have been praying but we're actually going to unite with a, a prayer movement that God is stirring in our city um, I've already um, taken the liberty to partner us with over 300 churches across greater Nashville. And together, we're going to pray for every human being that lives in the city of Nashville. By name, every human being in Nashville, we're going we're to be a part of a movement praying for everyone, asking God to open their hearts to his love, to stir in them, to break through into their life. And uh, the way that's going to work is starting, uh, um, do we have them today, Rachel? We do have them today, like in the, out there in the lobby, at, like the table. What's that thing called? Guest table? Info table? <laughs> you guys know what I mean. We've got packets. If you want to be a part of this, just take a packet. Inside that packet, there's 15 names. Uh, there's other prayer resources in there. Don't take a packet unless you're going to pray for those names. We, we need those names prayed for. But if you're willing to start praying for those names on January 27th, you want to pray longer, I guess you can, but we're going to officially start after this on January 27th. We're going to pray for 21 days for these families, or these names individually. Then you're going to handwrite a note to them. There's a form letter in that packet too. And uh, the note is simply going to say, hey, my name is Jake. I've been praying for you for 21 days for God's love to break into your life. I want you to know he sees you. He loves you. Uh, just thought you ought to know that. Sign your name. That's it. No return address. No nothing. It's not in the name of our church. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. What could God do through thousands of people across our city praying for every name, for a spiritual awakening to happen, for an uprising to happen? So if you want to be a part of that, just grab yourself a packet. We'll have them there this week. We'll have them there next week. And we'll have them there the week when we start on the 27th, if there's any left at that point. I, I can actually get more if we run out. Um, but grab one of those if you want and uh, put that on your radar. The only other thing I want to say about that is there's going to be a big prayer and worship kickoff at the Ryman for that prayer um, movement on the 27th. So there's two services at 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. at the Ryman, uh, different congregants from all the 300 churches. You have tickets are free, 
but you do have to go online and register for them. Like, here's how many tickets I want, and they're free, and if you take a ticket, use it, or get it to somebody who will. But if you want to do that, just email me, jake at churchofthecity.com, and I'll send you the link where you can get your free tickets to the, the Ryman kickoff uh, for Awaken. Thank you guys. We're going to continue our series next week. Grace and peace.